The Conquer Worry Show, episode number seven. This show is not to be considered medical advice. The contents of the show are for informational purposes only. Nothing should be considered or used as a substitute for professional medical or mental health advice, diagnosis, or treatment. If you are struggling, please seek professional medical assistance and call 911 if there is an emergency. Global hotlines can be found on conquerworry.org. Welcome to the Conquer Worry Show, the show dedicated to creating awareness of the resources that are available for those who struggle with worry, anxiety, or depression. If you are struggling now, if you have struggled in the past, or someone you love is struggling, this is the show for you. For joining us for another edition of the Conquer Worry Show. I am your host, Jay Coulter. I am not a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a counselor, or even a social worker. I'm just someone who struggled with a bad bout of depression, got through to the other side, and now I'm dedicated to helping others who have struggled find the resources that they need. On today's episode of the Conquer Worry Show, I'm going to play an interview that we conducted with Andy Bierman, a.k.a. Electro Boy. He wrote a book back in 2002 about his manic experience with bipolar disorder. It is an incredibly interesting story. It's entertaining, but also there's a great message in there. In fact, it really is a self-help book at its core for anybody who is struggling. Now, I always have... A lot of respect for somebody who is willing to talk about their struggles when it comes to mental health. And Andy really takes it to a new level. He talks about his time in prison, house arrest, his crazy episodes, which include an experience where he flies all over the world in a single day just to balance out the effects of being hot in one country and cold in another. And then he he talks a little bit about his experience with electroshock therapy. So I can't really do Andy's story any justice. Let's let him tell his story. Today on the Conquer Worry Show, we have Andy Bierman, a.k.a. Electro Boy. He is a mental health writer, a speaker, having spoken to over 200 mental health organizations, psychiatric groups, and college audiences. His book, Memoir of a Mania, which released in 2002, has been translated into six different languages and is distributed across the globe. The New York Times called the book the latest, most hyperkinetic book in a robust genre. Rosie O'Donnell called the book, or said of the book, that he's very insightful and very funny, and it's a really beautiful book. And W Magazine called it compulsively readable. He's had feature articles in the New York Times, New York Magazine, the BBC, and NPR, as well as CNN with Cooper Anderson, have run features on him. Now, that is... So, Andy, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Jay. Sure. Now, I've given given our listeners a little bit of a background on what's been going on with you here recently, but you have a great backstory, and, you know, why don't you kind of walk our... Walk our listeners through the early years of Andy Okay, well, well, first of all, just, uh, just to make it clear, um, uh, the title of my book is Electro Boy, A Memoir of Mania, and I'll explain to you later how it got that title. But uh, my backstory, uh, my, my backstory is, uh, well, you know, I'll, I'll start, you know, in my mid-20s. I was diagnosed very, very late with bipolar disorder. Um, I believe I was 31 years old. Uh, you know, that was years ago, and like right now, that would be considered, um, you know, a little bit late. Um, and in looking back to my childhood, which was a typical suburban upbringing in New Jersey, um, I probably think now, 
uh, you know, if it was 2014, it could have been diagnosed. I was uh, a somewhat hyper child. I was, quote, creative. Uh, I had lots of interests. I had lots of obsessions. Uh, but I think at that time when nobody was talking about, God forbid, you know, depression, bipolar disorder, otherwise known as manic depression, it was just easier to kind of uh, put me in a box and categorize me as, you know, that really creative kid uh, who had lots of wild ideas in his head. Okay. So, that's childhood. That's childhood. So tell us, tell us a little bit about your college years. Where'd you go? Did, 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 I, did went to, I went to Wesleyan University in Middletown, Connecticut. Uh, you know, went to a, grew up in a, in a very typical suburban New Jersey neighborhood, conservative. My family was not conservative. Uh, I went to a public school. Uh, and life was very, very simple and, uh, you know, really had no real worries. Uh, at least I wasn't supposed to have any worries, except inside my brain was teeming with tons of anxiety, stress, and all that. So um, I only had one visit to a therapist in high school, you know, as I was about ready to go to college. Um, I think the day I arrived at college, all hell broke loose. I mean, it was, you know, all of a sudden I was I was around, like, other 18-year-olds who had already experimented with drugs and alcohol and sex, and this was a whole new world for me. I mean, I had really been sheltered. And for somebody who is bipolar, you know, just having this, you know, shoved in your face and within reach, you know, all in one day – uh, is pretty overwhelming, and my my natural response was just to indulge. So, so looking I back, did. looking back now, if you were your parents, is there anything that you could have done to make that transition different? Uh, the transition to college? Yeah, uh, I think my parents could have done something. You know, years and years before that. I mean, if they had, you know. A, a basic knowledge of, of mental illness and you know, specifically bipolar disorder. But I don't even, I had no, I don't have, I don't really think that my parents had any idea what they were shoving me into or what I had chosen to jump into, which was a, a lot of independence, uh, going to a liberal arts school, choosing classes, choosing friends, uh, and having all of these elements that were really not in my conservative upbringing. Right. Right. So for a parent today who maybe has a child struggling with this, would you have any advice for that life transition? From yeah, I don't think there's a real rush to start freshman year when, uh, you know, uh, it could be more helpful to kind of hold back and figure out exactly what's going on. I mean, I speak at colleges all over the country, and when I speak to, uh, for example, you know, big audiences, I know I've been successful after when a uh, dean of students calls two or three days later and says, you know, Andy, you spoke to 600 students and 11 of them are not coming back next semester. Um, they're going home and going into treatment or they're going into rehab and they've identified, you know, the fact that there's a problem, that it's a mental health issue. And uh, so I feel like you know, that's, the, that's the best I can do. Um, I can... Uh, tell my story, and I think it's important to tell your story. I mean, when I wrote Electro Boy, I decided you know, there was really nothing in the genre at that point, especially by a male about bipolar disorder, and I figured if I'm going to write this story, it's just going to be the true story. Now, of course, the reaction was, you know, a little frightening. It was like, oh, my God, this book is, you know, raw, gritty. Uh, you know, some people said it was just really just – uncontrolled madness. Well, you know, it's not a pretty illness, bipolar disorder, nor is any mental illness. I mean, cancer is not pretty, diabetes isn't pretty, MS isn't pretty. But I think we're always told, well, you know, just kind of uh, keep it under your hat, um, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, and, you know, it's, it's an invisible illness. Yep, yep. So. Well, going back to your story chronologically then, after school, I think I read somewhere that you had changed jobs as, as often as people change outfits. Could you talk uh, a little much. bit about yeah, that? I, I, unfortunately, I, uh, I landed in Manhattan um, in the mid-'80s, which was uh, a pretty crazy time in Manhattan. Uh, 
And, uh, you know, I was doing all different kinds of things. I was trying to make an independent film because I had some background in film. I was uh, working for Giorgio Armani as uh, as a publicity person. I uh, went into the publicity business. I went into um, I went into writing gossip columns uh, for two different magazines. I had no idea what I wanted to do. I mean, and I also got very caught up in doing things that were risky and dangerous. I mean. Not only was I working for Giorgio Armani, but I was pimping for Giorgio Armani, the designer, I mean, which was very odd. But I didn't see the consequences in doing it. Uh, and then I also became a stripper. Uh, and everyone always you know, says to me, God, how could you have done that? I, you know, I think when you're bipolar, you don't really realize the decisions that you're making. You don't put them into the category of, well, this is a really great decision. You just do whatever comes in front of your way. One day I was walking by a theater. And I said, "Oh, that looks like a good idea. Look, they're paying twenty-five dollars just for uh, just to you know to come audition. I'll do that." Mm-hmm. Um, when I look back now and look at all of the things that I did, I mean, I also became an art dealer, which you know I'm sure you'll want to discuss later. But uh, you know, all kinds of ideas came into my head. I mean, in fact, at one point I said to my dad, "You know," well, he said, "You know, what do you want to do?" He tried to kind of get me focused. I said, "You know, I think I may want to go into the NASA program." and be an astronaut. I mean, that was a sign that something wasn't right. Is it fair to say, though, that a a young man in his 20s doesn't always know what he wants to do? In fact, most people don't. And you were obviously... That's true, but a young man in his 20s doesn't try out literally 25 different jobs. It just doesn't happen that way. Sure. And and, and those jobs are not as risky as the ones that I chose. I mean, yeah, you may go work... Uh, for a real estate company, or you may go work uh, at a bank, uh, or you. But all the things I did were rather entrepreneurial. Uh, there wasn't much organization to them, and I just, I just dove in head first. Sure, sure. Well, I tell you what, as a thought exercise, if you could go back in time and give yourself advice as though you were a friend. And specifically looking at this through a lens of if somebody has a friend that they think is experiencing this now, what would you suggest they have them do? I, I, I would sit that friend down and say, in my case, hey, Andy, you know, you seem to be really a little bit all over the map. Um, I know that you have a variety of interests, but, you know, you can't be writing a gossip column and dealing art and being a go-go boy and having a public relations firm, it seems like you're really overwhelmed. How do you feel? At which point I would have said, I feel great. I feel fine. I can do it all. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big multitasker. And I have to say that, you know, one of my employers at one point, I always thought was taking, taking advantage of my mental illness. I mean, here I was sleeping three, four hours a night, and I was sleeping in the office, you know, on bubble wrap behind my desk. And who else is going to have an employee who puts in more than a seven-hour workday and a one-hour lunch? I mean, I didn't even eat lunch. I just kept going 21 hours. Mm-hmm. I was always accessible, and I also was extremely productive. I bet. Yeah. I, I bet. Not it. just because of time, because I could really manage the time. That would be an employer's dream, wouldn't it? Right, right. And, you know, you, you know, when you're not doing the 40-hour work week and you're doing the 140-hour work week, you are valuable. Right, right. Too yeah. bad you weren't billing by the hour. Uh, well, I made up for it. So, <laughs> <laughs> and so in your book, there's a story about you flying around the globe to, quote, balance out. Can, can you tell our listeners a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I was at the point where I needed to keep moving, moving, moving. It wasn't like I had to go to the park and run, you know, six or eight miles. I do that, too. But, you know, there were mornings at like 3 a.m. I remember one time I was watching CNN and I saw the Berlin Wall coming down. And I was like, oh, Wow. I got to go there. I got to touch that. I got to, you know, I saw people taking pieces of the wall. So I got on in a cab in Manhattan at 81st and Broadway, and I write about this in Electro Boy. And I uh, took a cab to the airport, um, picked a flight that was flying to uh, Paris, met a friend in Paris, took a train to Berlin. Um, But yeah, it was all over the place. I was in Italy, I was in Japan, I was in. you know, all over the states, uh, all through South America. I mean, I just couldn't stop moving. And I think you're referring to a line where I wrote, uh, 
you know, I, I, it was, I think I just disca- described my bipolar disorder uh, with the, the sweet and sour theory, which is like if I went to Switzerland and it was cold, I had to balance it out by uh, going to the Caribbean. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. And I just want to clarify, you saw the Berlin Wall get knocked down. You went and got on a plane and you were touching it within, what, 24 hours? Yeah, within like 36 hours. Yeah, yeah. That's but, you know, that, I think that's the bipolar mind. I think the bipolar mind is, hey, I got this idea, but I'm going to act on it. You know, and sometimes the ideas that you have, you know, they're, they're, the consequences are extremely huge. And if you screw up, and I did screw up later, then you pay the price. And, of course, once you're – once you realize what you've done and there's like a, a flash of reality, you're like, oh, my God, what was I thinking, you know? Yep. So. Yep. Well, I tell you what, why don't, could you shed a little light on your experience in the art dealer world, the good and yeah, the Yeah, I was uh, – it was the late uh, – no, it's actually the early 90s in New York when art was a hot commodity. Young artists were all doing really well. Uh and Keith Haring, Basquiat, uh, Schnabel, all those guys. Um, and I went to work uh, for an artist whose last name was Kostabi, who didn't paint any of his own paintings. He had a factory, and he had other people painting them. So he would come up with the ideas, and he had 40 factory workers who would execute the paintings. Um, some of them were his idea ideas, and he had some idea people who did it. And I became his publicist and art dealer. Um, and, you know, we were we were probably pumping out 40, 50 paintings a week, uh, you know, some of them selling for as much as, you know, $30,000, $40,000 at, at that point, some for a few thousand dollars, and also lithographs and sculpture. And uh, I uh, realized that instead of making wanting to make a 15% commission, I'd rather want, I wanted to make it all. So with a friend who was an artist there, we started painting the same paintings in a studio outside of Manhattan in Brooklyn, and uh, she, I would pay her for the paintings, and then I would get on the plane, travel to Japan, and uh, I would, you know, sell, you know, 20, 30, 40 paintings and come back with tons of money. Um, this went on for about 18 months, and then one day I went to work. And when I got to my office, which was a huge building on the on the west side of Manhattan, there was police tape all around the building. So I knew there was trouble. Okay, sure. so I, I went home right away. And then it took me actually it took them actually two years, the federal government to indict me on five counts of wire fraud. But you know technically it was art counterfeiting, although he didn't paint it of, of his own paintings. And often he didn't sign them. I signed them. It was a very crazy trial, which I really detail in Electro Boy. But, you know, for me, the art forgery is the pinnacle of my mania, um, without a doubt. So are you, t- are you speaking specifically of those 18 months where you were getting away with it? Uh, yeah, that, that, that period, yes. But also the period after that where I had no idea – uh, I mean, then I became just obsessed with the idea that this guy uh, who was the defendant, who I didn't really connect with, I was a little disassociated from him, uh, I was really going to wage this huge defense campaign and make sure that he wasn't convicted, that he was me, um, with my attorney. And uh, that attorney was pretty successful, and I was only found guilty on one charge of wire fraud, for which several months later I was sentenced to five months in prison and five months under house arrest. Now, this whole time, I'm still not being treated for bipolar disorder, (laughs) which, you know, that's the shocking part. Was there a treatment for anything? Uh, There was a treatment for uh, agitation. I was diagnosed by seven doctors with depression. They were all wrong. but nothing really uh, – no, there wasn't a real treatment that was really focused, and uh, I slipped through the cracks. I slipped through the cracks of a lot of doctors who didn't ask the right questions, not to mention I was not a great patient. I didn't tell doctors when I was manic and high. You know, I mean, 
why should I? I mean, I felt great. I didn't want to to report, oh, wow, guess what? I'm feeling great. And, you know, I'm counterfeiting artwork and, you know, leading this incredibly uh, insane life. Yeah. Yeah. So would you think the doctors would have caught the diagnosis if you were more forthcoming? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but they didn't ask all the right questions. I mean, if you're going to pay a doctor, you know, because you you don't have insurance at the time and you're going to pay your doctor for, you know, two sessions a week and it's $200 a session and, you know, you give him $1,600 in cash, you should ask where the money's coming from. You would think, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I guess this is probably another simplistic thought exercise, but if you've got a buddy that you think is struggling with it, yeah, it sounds like you just need to implore them to be honest with their medical health professional so they get the right. Well, I mean, you can just say, you know, this isn't going to work. You're going to stay in the same place. What's the expression? It's just like running around a, uh, a you know, a wheel, you know, like a, like a, a, a durable does. You know, you're just going to keep going and going and going. You're going to exhaust yourself. I mean, right. you know, but then, you know, you've got to be able to be willing to accept you know, what you think is going to be like the worst judgment in the world. Like, how can you be doing that? I mean, my whole, my whole fear was being found out. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yep. Yeah. Right, so I mean, you, what, what came after the house arrest? Uh, the house arrest where I wore the, uh, where I wore an ankle bracelet on my ankle for five months. Um, what came next was uh, the fact that the bipolar disorder was not under control uh, I was experiencing lots of psychosis, uh, mostly uh, visual hallucinations, um, and there were several suicide attempts. Uh, some of them were just truly psychotic. I mean, they weren't even real. Yeah, there were there were no there were two overdoses. But at one point, I tried to drown myself in the bathtub and called my doctor and I said, you know, I just tried to drown myself in the bathtub. And she said, how did you do it? I said, I got into the bathtub and I just put my head under. And she said, well, what happened? I said, well, nothing. There was no water in the bathtub. Oh. But in my head, it seemed real. Gotcha. It real. Yeah. yeah. And then so what it kind was, of treatments did you start receiving after those types well, of Well, after I had tried 45 medications, I know there's so many people out there who go through so many different medication regimens. And, you know, at that time, I was taking maybe 10, 12, 13 uh, medications at a time. The side effects were terrible. You know, I brought up the issue with my doctor of electroshock therapy, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, technically. And she said to me, Andy, uh, you know, you're really sensitive to medication. I think you're going to have a bad response to ECT. Um, I was referred to another psychiatrist, and he deemed that I was worthy, or, or, or that, or that ACT would be a good treatment for me. And probably within a day or so, I was checked into a hospital, and the first of four out of 19 treatments began. Um, I was scared to death the first time, only because you know I had seen you know, images of Francis Farmer having ECT and read about Ernest Hemingway. But uh, I'm not pro-ECT or anti-ECT. It's just that there were side effects that my doctor did not tell me about. I mean, he did not get the straight scoop on memory loss. And the memory loss was terrible. I mean, to the point where, you know, I would walk on the street, you know, for weeks and months after, and I would see somebody I thought I knew, and I'd have to avoid them because I couldn't come up with their name in my head. Or when my sister came in uh, to the uh, hospital room, you know, I told my parents to ask the nurse to leave. I had no idea who she was. So cognitive impairment, bad, very yeah. bad. Yeah, definitely. I know some folks that struggle with anxiety or depression have some memory issues, but this seems to be at a whole nother level. Is that fair? This is a this is like a, this is like a weird dreamlike level. Like you know when you wake up and. Uh, you think you've remembered your whole dream, and then seconds later you remember nothing. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what happens to your reality. It's just not there anymore. How long after your last treatment did you start to feel normal again, like you had your memory? Um, prob- I mean, I, my treatments lasted uh, over 18 months, and it probably took me another two years after the last treatment to feel like everything was back, but even today, which is years later, I mean, almost, wow, 
almost 20 years later, there are certain periods of time that I do not remember at all. And it's, and I can remember periods before that better, but periods that were affected by that ACT, I just don't remember at all. Wow. Just wiped out. Wow. All right. So you say you're not pro it or against it at this, at this point? No. I mean, I think if, you know, if somebody is suicidal and medication is not going to work quickly enough and it's going to provide them with some temporary relief, well, it's a risk you have to take. But you also have to ask your doctor, you know, what's the strategy? What's your regimen? I mean, like, why did my doctor want to give me, you know, one ECT treatment every week for, for life? I, you know, I stopped at 19 because I knew enough was enough. Mm-hmm. Um, the answer to that question is it's lucrative. Insurance companies pay. Yep. Anesthesiologists get paid. So, you know, yep. back then there was four or $5,000 in a treatment. Wow. Okay. You know, plus hospitalization. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I tell you what, on the Conquer Worry Show, we really like to focus on recovery and success stories. And you're clearly a great story of recovery and growth. You're actually one of my new heroes now because you're willing well, to talk you. about the struggles that you went through. And uh, as I try and do it myself and I try and encourage other people to do it, it's just the, the depth at which you share your stories in this book really are impressive. And I think you're a pioneer in that area. Well, thank you. No, I mean, it was a huge risk. You know, I started writing in, you know, probably 1998, and when nobody was talking about mental illness, and I said, if I am going to write about this, I'm going to tell the real story. Yes, it's going to be humiliating to my parents. It's even humiliating for me to read some of it. But, you know, why not? I don't, I don't see anything else out there that's so, uh, that's so truthful. So I do get some criticism for that, and that's okay. I think people who suffer with mental illness or have family and friends with mental illness or, you know, mental health care professionals, you know, they'll read a lecture boy and they'll say, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. This is bipolar disorder. Mm-hmm. This is a pretty intense form of it. And it's pretty, ag- it's, you know, it's pretty aggressive in how it's attacking him. But this is a real story. And I can't tell you how many people have written to me since after, you know, after reading a lecture boy and saying, you know, wow, that's my story. But I've never told anyone all of those things, you know, so. Yep. Yep, that's got to be fairly rewarding for you as well. Yeah, it's rewarding. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll, certainly over the embarrassment of it. Yeah. Uh, definitely over the embarrassment of it. I mean, I'm not, you know, when people use the word recovery, and I think it's just an issue of semantics, I prefer to say that, you know, I live with bipolar disorder, and I've learned to cope and manage with it, you know, every single day. And it always lurks around the corner in some big way. I, I feel like it, you know, it's funny. I, I live in Los Angeles now. I, I lived in New York. You know, for quite a while, but I've been here for more than a decade. And you know, just a couple of weeks ago, I was in the first earthquake I've ever been in. And I was thinking, oh wow, this is how frightening bipolar disorder is. You just have no idea when things are going to be, you know, just shake up. Yeah. Um, but yep. oddly, I wasn't frightened by it. But <laughs> well, I can appreciate that feeling on a level, at least with regards to my own experience with depression. It's it's managed, and that is a better term, and it probably is more than just semantics. That's probably a term I should use on the show because around any corner, you know, that black dog of depression can start barking again. Oh, yeah, again. And, it's, and it's silent, and it's invisible. I mean, you know, I mean, depression is, uh, you know, people always say to me, people with depression say, oh, God, I, I, I trade my depression for your bipolar disorder any day. My depression is so painful. Well, First of all, I've experienced quite a bit of depression. I mean, you know, the crashes from my mania are pretty horrible. Um, but, you know, imagine that bipolar disorder is like walking a tightrope, and you know that there's no net underneath you, and you know there, you know, there are not 20, 20 guys there ready to catch you when you fall. And that's pretty scary, too. I mean, I was used to long for depression. I longed for my depressive uh, phases. Wow. I haven't heard too many people say that. In fact, I've never heard anybody say that. No, but it was a rest, mm-hmm. and I knew I was safe because I wouldn't go out. Okay. So, well, hey, tell me, are you uh, you working on a sequel to Electro Boy? Yeah, I'm working on a sequel to Electro Boy. I uh, it's uh, it kind of picks up exactly where I left off, which was uh, someone says, I don't know what happened at the end of that book. Well, you know what? I didn't know what happened either, and. Random House said, well, you know, we've got this book, Electro Boy, it's this very honest account of mental illness, but um, what are you supposed to say? I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to say because, you know, I'm writing this in the middle of my recovery, 
Um, I don't know where I'm going, and it just kind of ends. But it's clear that it's got to pick up somewhere. So I moved to L.A. I got married. Um, right now I have two kids who are both almost seven, two, da- two daughters who are seven and nine. And uh, I'm a single dad, though. I mean, I'm divorced, and life has changed quite a bit. Um, but it's a much easier life. It's a much easier life being a dad, um, getting out of myself, being responsible for, you know, two kids. And, uh, you know, I think it's one of the best tools for managing my mental illness. Sure. I'm sure it's therapeutic. And did I also read that you're working on a self-help book for people with manic depression? Yeah, I'm working on a self-help book with uh, a mental health advocate named Chris Curry, who is in Ottawa. And it's a, uh, it's, I think it's, I think it's probably it probably will be the first no bullshit uh, self help guide. I mean, it's not like you know do this, do that, try this, try that. It's like it 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 it, it tries to get through to the person who really doesn't want any help. Although oddly, Electro Boy became. I mean, I, I thought it was a memoir. I mean, it is a memoir, but it became a huge. It became hugely popular as a self help book. Because people compare their experiences to my experiences, and, uh, you know, they picked up some clues, and uh, they took what they could get from it. So I was happy for that. Yeah, that that makes sense how that would intuitively become a self-help book if somebody's struggling with the same issues. Exactly. And it also made people, you know, say, wow, I don't have that shame that I live with anymore. I mean, look at this guy. He did so many things that are worse than me. I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, if, if I had to tell my parents any of this stuff, you know, they'd kill me. Yep, that's right. So, well, tell us a little bit about the consulting services that you offer. Well, I mean, it's 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 very flexible. I mean, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a social worker. But I've wasted a lot of time with uh, mental health care professionals, probably a good 11 of them. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one who really guided me and, you know, was a, she was the only woman of the group. And we probably spent 12 years together. Um, and I just think people and families lead their loved ones to some pretty bad choices. Uh, not just because they, there's a, not just because there's a lack of mental health care services or, uh, or accessibility is difficult. Yeah, that's a huge problem. But the point is they get caught up you know, seeing doctors who prescribe on the first visit, uh, they don't get second opinions. They don't work with a, ther- a psychologist and a psychiatrist at the same time. Uh, they're running to rehabs that are useless. Uh, and nobody's really like, nobody's shaking these people up and talking to them directly and really spending time with them. I mean, it, it sounds like bragging, but I think in in a good two hour period, I can accomplish more with someone as far as giving them a strategy and a wake-up call, you know, in, in, in that two-hour period, than you know, somebody can do in six months. And I think it's I'm 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 always there for it. Hey, experience is the best teacher. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So, what's the best way for listeners to reach you? Um, well, on, on on Twitter, um, uh, at Electro Boy USA. Uh, my website is electroboy.com. Uh, Random House uh, is no longer publishing Electro Boy 12 years later, but there are always copies available on Amazon, or I can make copies available to people and ship them faster than anybody. Uh, I personally deliver them. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> if I could, I would. <laughs> yeah, I noticed uh, on Amazon today there are copies available. Uh, there still are. Out there. Yeah, there always are. Okay. Well, great. Well, hey, when your new books come out, I hope you come back on the Conquer Warriors show and tell us a little bit about them. And I really appreciate you joining us today. I know that you've helped some of our listeners today better understand what they're going through. Well, thank you, Jay. And thanks for getting in touch with me and uh, getting me out there. All right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. What an interview. I tell you, It was a privilege to interview Andy. I have so much respect for people who are willing to go public with their struggles and and attempt to try and help other people. And like we talked about in the interview, his book really can serve as a self-help book, if you will, for people who are going through some type, any type of mental struggle. If you have a chance, 
head on over to Amazon.com and try and track down a copy of his book or visit his website, electroboy.com. So if you enjoyed this episode of the Conquer Worry Show, please head on over to the iTunes directory or Stitcher directory, wherever you're listening to us, and rate the show. It'll only help us expand the reach and help more people. If you have a story that you think our listeners would appreciate that can help them in their struggle, please head over to conquerworry.org. Send us a message. Maybe we could get you on the show and your story could help somebody else. If you're struggling, please seek professional medical help. And as always, live your life in relentless pursuit of your life's purpose. <laughs>